I was born June 21st, 1989. Anybody born in June? Yeah. I just was always happy because I used to feel sorry for people who were born in December and their mama had to bring them cupcakes to school. Like, I was just like, that sucks that you got to celebrate your birthday at school. Um, so my birthday was always when school was out. And I was born to a, uh, in a single parent household. I think that already kind of established a bit of confusion in me just because I didn't have a father figure. My dad was very inconsistent. He would <clears throat> come into my life in seasons and then come out of my life. And so my entire framework of men for a long time was that men were not to be trusted, that men said things that they did not believe, that men did things that they did not uh, really want to do specifically when it related to me. Um, I was introduced to pornography around the age of five or six, um, and I was molested around the age of seven. So you have to understand that now I'm not only fatherless, but I'm also being introduced to sexuality in its preferred form. I'm being introduced to sexuality in a way that makes it seem as if sexuality is to be outside of marriage, but also that it means that it's to be an objectifying thing, that it has no dignity attached, that it has nothing to do with glory, and it has nothing to do with Jesus. It's just people doing what they want to do. Um, and so I'm already having kind of a confused perspective when it comes to sex itself. I think that's why our generation of millennials, if you will, I think that's why we're kind of jacked up now is because we see we have been introduced to sexuality in a distorted form and so now when people tell us that sex is beautiful within marriage between one man and one woman it sounds confusing it doesn't sound as beautiful because that wasn't the original way we learned about it in the first place and so that's where I came from um, growing up I also had gender confusion so I felt in myself that I wasn't supposed to be a woman. It felt as if this body was not my own. It felt like this body was a bit strange. I felt more comfortable uh, being in masculine positions and doing masculine things. And honestly, to be frank, I believe the culture has assisted us in this kind of confusion. Because for too long, it has made femininity and masculinity things that are not biblical. For somebody like me who doesn't like pink, um, who doesn't wear purses because I don't like extra baggage. I would prefer to have my debit card and my phone in my back pocket. I have been told growing up that that made me a tomboy, that that made me less than feminine. And so now when people start to question themselves, what they're questioning is things that wasn't even non-feminine in the first place. Um, and so I just was just confused. Um, and so I went to church with my aunt. My aunt, my mother is not a believer. And so I didn't go to church with her, but I went to church with my aunt every weekend who was. And the thing about my aunt that was crazy is that she, it was just weird to be, Christians are weird. Um, I'm sure y'all know that. Jesus was writing on the ground, you know, while people was talking, telling people to stone people. It's like, why are you writing on the ground, bro? Like, what are you doing? Um, my aunt, was a clear contrast to my mother. And I remember there were two situations where I saw how Jesus makes people different. The first situation was we were at a thrift store because she really loved thrifting. And this lady, I guess, cut her off. Something happened in traffic where the lady got mad at my aunt and she just started to cuss my aunt clean out. My aunt, just this sweet lady with like a dress down to her ankles that listen to gospel all the time. She's just like, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. And she meant it. And I was so confused. I'm like, this lady is talking to you crazy and you just talk about some God bless. You need to curse her out too. I don't understand how you just gonna let somebody disrespect you. But Jesus had changed her. The second situation was, I remember uh, I would be at our home and she would be singing the Psalms. And as a six-year-old, I'm like, why are you singing a song that doesn't rhyme? I don't, I don't really understand how like nothing connects. It's just you and Jesus. But to me, it was a distinctive difference between how she lived her life and how I saw my mother live her life where to me, it began to do something in my own conscience and in my own heart where it's like, man, God really does make people different. He really does change people. Um, but while being in church, I still had these affections for same sex or these same sex desires. I still felt in and of myself that I was not who I thought I was supposed to be. 
but the way they talked about my struggles from the pulpit made me feel like I wasn't too free to confess that. Um, it seemed as if it was discussed in such a way where if I was to be open about how I felt that it would be met with stones and not grace. It felt as if the church was not a safe place for me to be free about how uh, my mind was thinking and how my soul felt. It felt as if I was a leper. It felt as if hell must have had a special place for me specifically. Like that's how I felt. Like I'm gonna go straight to hell and they just gonna have a VIP just for Jackie Hill Perry right there. But I think God was faithful in developing my conscience in such a way that though the church may not have met my uh, feelings in a way that felt safe. I still felt as if how I felt wasn't clearly right. So high school comes, that's when I got completely ratchet. I think high school, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, high school just turns you into somebody else. Uh, <laughs> high school, I just started doing what I wanted to do, started to become incredibly rebellious. I, I still am a rebel. I, I just try to submit that under Jesus. But I'm just not a fan of authority. I'm just not a fan of people telling me what to do. Uh, I, I was so bad. Please don't follow my lead, but I was so bad to the point that my freshman year, I would, my teacher would hand me the paper, I would sign my name and give it back to her. And she was like, you didn't do anything. I signed my name, like you didn't, <laughs> I don't get an A for effort. Like I just thought like she should give me a sticker or something. And so I was just a terrible student. I was a terrible person. Um, high school dance, I was 17. This young lady that I knew from middle school, she came up to me and she asked me if I would be her girlfriend. By this time, no one had ever known that I was same sex attracted because at, in that season of my life, it wasn't a cool thing to do. Um, and so nobody had known. So she asked if I could be her girlfriend. And I was just like, girl, that is really gay. Like, you need to get out of my face because I had to like front, you know, and act like that's not what I was with. But when I went home, I could not get her question out of my mind. Um, and I sat at home and I started to wrestle with her invitation. And I started to ask myself, Jackie, like, you've been wanting to do this for a long time. You've been feeling these desires since you were five, since you were six. Like, why not do it now? And so I got on my space. I don't know if y'all remember that anymore. <laughs> That's when time was cool. Uh, I got on my space. Does it even exist? Is it alive? He probably works for Zuckerberg or something, I'm sure. Um, that's the Facebook guy. Um, I got on MySpace and I, I messaged her and we entered into a relationship that lasted maybe six and a half days. After that relationship, if you want to call it that, um, I called this guy because in my mind, I'm like, okay, God doesn't like gay people. So let me just try to be straight. So I called this dude because yeah, I did. And I remember, kissing him and it felt like every attraction I had had for a guy had left it felt like it wasn't natural it felt like it wasn't normal so I made up in my mind that it must be that I am supposed to be gay so what did I do I got back on my space and I got into a relationship with one young lady who I was with for two years in that relationship is when I transitioned into the role of a stud so in the black community a stud is the lesbian female uh, that dresses typically in masculine apparel. She typically is uh, the domineering voice in the relationship. She plays the male, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think in white communities, sometimes it's called butch. Um, and so that's what I was. And in that world, I had boxers, I sagged my pants, I wore uh, sports bras that would flatten my chest so that you couldn't see it. At that time I had long hair, so I would just put my hair back in a ponytail. I was never bold enough to do a low cut. I was a bit scared of how I would look with short hair. Um, and so that's what I was. I was going to gay clubs, going to gay pride parades, um, engaging in that lifestyle to the fullest extent that I could. But while I was in it, the interesting thing is, is there was this kind of dichotomy of having fun, but not having joy. And I couldn't really figure out the difference between the two because I was enjoying myself. I loved my girlfriend, I loved my friends. I felt like what I was doing was who I was, but at the same time, I could not get a hold of peace and I didn't necessarily know how to because I felt like Christianity was just a bunch of duty, dutiful people. Like they just seem, I, I used to go to church and everybody just seemed unhappy. 
I was just like, why are these people so mad all the time? Like, it's just, I just didn't want to be that. And I didn't want to wear long dresses and just listen to only gospel. Like, I just felt like that was what Christianity was. I had never known that Christianity was Jesus. I had never known that Christianity was relationship. I had never known that salvation was a supernatural work of the Spirit of God. So I'm in this lifestyle, I'm doing me. Um, the interesting thing is a Christian never spoke to me while I was in it. When I would be around Christians, they would actually look past me. They would look through me. They wouldn't look at me. They wouldn't talk to me. They would ignore me. And I'm not sure why. I can't judge their motives, but I think it could be two things. One, three things. It could be fear. Fear of how I would respond to them if they told me about Jesus. I think another thing could have been self-righteousness is that they assumed that my sin deserved more hell than their self-righteousness did. I think another thing could have been just indifference, no concern for how God was seeing me in that moment. Um, but the thing was, God was faithful to continue to work on me. So my convictions just would not let up. I think that's the thing about when you kind of grow up in church is that <laughs> you know too much to be able to do things without conviction. And so I knew a lot about God, so my convictions would not wane, and I didn't like it. I, I would be at the club, and I'm just like, I don't understand why I'm thinking about Jesus right now. I just really wish this would go away. So I called my cousin. My cousin was the only believer that I knew who would not um, quote revelations as soon as we got on the phone. I don't know if you know any of those kinds of saints uh, that just, just won't tell you about hell every time y'all get on the phone. You, you know you're going to hell, right? I didn't, I didn't, she wasn't one of those. Um, she would actually have a conversation with me, ask me about my day. Um, and so I called her and I was like, Keisha, I feel like God is calling me, but I really don't want him. I, I just, I don't want God, like I'm enjoying my life, I'm, I'm having fun, I'm like chilling, you know what I'm saying, like I could really do without him. And she told me, she was like, God is gonna show you how much you need him. I wish she didn't say that because my life just became real bad. Uh, it just got hectic, so I'ma I'm just say this briefly. So my dad died, that was sucky. Um, and then I got some money from him dying and being the fool that I am, got on eBay and bought a car. Don't ever buy a car on eBay, okay? Um, just don't do it. So I got on eBay, bought a car, had that car for about four weeks, um, and then it got towed, didn't have enough money to get it out the uh, tow shop, and then I got arrested because I used to steal. And so it just was terrible. Like, it was just like my life was just becoming uh, ridiculous. And it felt like God was just making my life horrible for me to take notice of His goodness for me to pay attention to him. And I think it's a mercy because there are some people who are living wicked lifestyles and they are in lives full of prosperity where they don't even have the opportunity to pay attention to God. And so I think that my life being a little bit hard was God's goodness towards me. October, 2008, I'm 19. And I'm in my bed. I wasn't at a church. I wasn't at a conference. There was no altar. Once again, I wasn't going to church. And I was in my bed. I was probably watching Making the Band or something really irrelevant. And I felt God speak to my heart and say that the girl that I was with would be the death of me. It was deep because I felt as if he wasn't just saying that lesbianism would be the death of me, but that my life would be the death of me. I think a lot of times when we have this conversation about homosexuality, one thing we forget is that homosexuality is only a piece of the problem. I'll explain. One time I, when my testimony came out, this girl, she messaged me and she, she went off on me and said that I was being judgmental, being bigoted, et cetera, et cetera. And that God was okay with her lifestyle. And I asked her, I said, if lesbianism wasn't even an issue for you, would God still be pleased with your life? Would you still be reckoned holy and righteous? And she said, no. That question, what it does is it identifies that lesbianism is not, or homosexuality is not the main problem. The problem is sin. Sin is the problem. Homosexuality is a leaf on a tree of sins. And so on that tree, you might have liar, you might have uh, lustful, you might have pride, you might have unrighteous anger. But what needs to be dealt with is not plucking off one sin. That's why you have some people that are saying, you know, I asked God to make me straight and he didn't. 
The problem was is you asked God to save you from one thing and not to save you from all of you. That was the problem. And so what needs to happen is, is that God needs to get a hold of the root. God needs to get to the root of the tree, change the tree through regeneration and sanctification and salvation so that the leaves now will bear fruit, where you will see joy and peace and self-control and all of the things that the fruit of the Spirit will produce. And so in me, I noticed that I had a big issue with the Lord. So I started to compare the cost. I started to think about everything that I loved and their consequences. So I thought about, okay, uh, okay, I think it's been clear that God don't like that. I done heard that all my life. Okay, that's not good. Oh, I really like uh, getting drunk. Man, that's a sin too. Dang. Um, I don't do honor my parents. Man, Old Testament was very clear that that's not okay with God. Oh, goodness gracious, I'm a thief. Hell, wow. Like, I was just like, everything I loved was terrible. Um, and what I saw was everything that I had affection for, everything that I enjoyed, everything that I did naturally, that at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. So I started to have this conversation with God and I was like, God, I, I hear what you're saying, you know, but I don't want to be straight. Like, that's just not something I want to do. And that disposition of heart that I had is typical, where if you meet those who are same sex attracted, you will hear, if you preach Jesus, what they hear you say is be straight. When in reality, Jesus is not calling us to heterosexuality. He is calling us to holiness. But it's hard to hear the difference. Hear me, heterosexuality is not the goal per se. Holiness is the goal because once I get to know Jesus, then he works out all the rest, right? I think sometimes people have become what I like to call heterosexual evangelists where when talking to the LBGTQ community, they will present the gospel of marriage or the gospel of being straight as if that is the goal of this life. As if when we get to heaven, we will have marriage between man and woman. Hey, marriage won't exist. What will exist is the lamb and the church. Will exist in the bridegroom and the bride. So we can't preach marriage. We need to preach Jesus. So what I came to see What I came to see was that God was ultimately calling me to himself. That God wanted me to know him. That God wanted me to love him. That God wanted me to serve him. So I told God in my bed, I'm like, man, what you called me to is hard. I had tried to be saved about 18 times, reading the little sinner's prayer on the back of the little books about heaven. Um, and it just never seemed to work because no one had ever explained to me that salvation was a supernatural work of the Spirit of God, that I can change my clothes all day, I can change my friends all day, I can start listening to certain music, but that would not change my heart, that would not change my nature, that would not change my mind, that I needed the Spirit of God to do the work for me. And so I told God, I don't know how to do what you are calling me to do, but I know enough about you to know that you will help me. I had no idea that that was repentance because I didn't know that word existed. I had no idea that was faith because I didn't know that that word existed. But what had happened was, is I saw my sin rightly. I saw it as unworthy of my time. I saw it as unworthy of my attention. I saw it as worthless. I saw it as not good. I saw it as an idol. I saw it as a lie. All of my sin hence. I saw it all for what it was and I turned. But I didn't turn to self-righteousness. I didn't turn in on myself to think that I can make myself saved. What I did was I turned to Christ, seeing that only He could save me, only He could change me, only He could renew me, only He could sanctify me, only He could regenerate me, and I had no choice but to believe. Faith is not optional. God was not suggesting that I would repent and believe in His name. He was commanding it. So that's what I did and God saved me. And I knew I was different the next day because I went to work. I used to work at Wendy's, so if y'all want the recipe for a Julia Bacon, 
um, and the sour cream and chopped potato, holla at me afterwards. Um, they do have real meat though, I'll let you know that. McDonald's, I can't vouch for them. Um, <laughs> obviously I have, I don't have, I have a thing against McDonald's anyway. Um, I was at work and this girl walked into the restaurant and I was behind the cash register and she was pretty. And I remember looking at her in, in typical fashion, what I would have did two days prior would be to stare at her, lust after her, objectify her, um, and maybe stare at her long enough to see if she, you know, was on the same page that I was on. But in my heart, I was aware of God for the first time. And it wasn't as if God was never sovereign before. It wasn't as if I didn't believe that he saw me when I was in sin. It was just that this time I cared. I cared about what God thought about my behavior. I had a reference for him that I had never felt. My clothes were still the same. I still had my sports bra on and my boxers on, but this time I wanted to honor God. I think it's valuable to talk about temptation when talking about these discussions because I believe some people in the church have propagated this kind of lie that to be set free from sin means to not be tempted by sin so I want to kill that because I've been in churches where they'll say well you know if God delivered you from that you shouldn't be struggling with it so if you're struggling with it then you're obviously still that. That's still who you are. The truth of the matter is that can't be true considering Jesus. Considering that it says that he was tempted, yet without sin. And so now, if, to me, if Jesus was tempted, yet didn't sin, then obviously temptation can't define deliverance. Then obviously temptation can't define my identity, but rather how I respond to it. And so being a believer means now that though I might be tempted, though I might still see beautiful women, though I might still want to lust after people, though I might still want to watch pornography, though I might still want to do things that are wicked in God's sight, now I have power. Now I have the ability to flee. Now I have the ability to turn. Now I have the ability to see God as better. That is how we fight, saints. That is how we trust, saints. That is how we walk righteously before our Father God. I think it would be beneficial for us to see that God made us for something. I feel like when I have this discussion, we talk a lot about sin as we should. We talk a lot about judgment as we should, and we talk a lot about grace as we should. But the truth is, at the end of the day, God made you for himself. Colossians 1.16 says, all things were made through him and for him. How often do you consider that you were made for God? That that all includes your gender. That that all includes your sexuality. That that all includes your body. That that all includes your hands that that all includes your eyes, that that all includes your mind, that all things were made for him. Have you ever considered that when you want to walk away from him? That you were made for God and God alone. I think we would do well to remember who God is though, that he is the creator, that he is all wise, that he is all powerful, that he is all good, that he is all sustaining, that he is all comforting, that he is everlasting, that nothing on this earth will last except God. Have we considered that? That we were made for him. We could talk about purity and we could talk about sexuality and we could talk about holiness, but at the end of the day, what it boils down to is that you were made for someone who is worthy of your body. That you are made for someone who knows how to comfort you. That you are made for someone who knows how to sustain you. God is not calling you to just stop doing stuff for the sake of stop doing stuff. God is not about that. God is in the ministry of delight. He is calling you to delight in himself. Do you know the gospel? I'm sure you've heard it a lot. Have you heard, you know the gospel? 
So I know we know that. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, that's the KJV, shall not perish but have everlasting life. The truth is, we were born not wanting him. We were born not delighting in him. We were born believing that our sexuality was our own to do with as we please. We were born believing that our body was a mean of our own glory and our own pride and our own fame. We all got this struggle. Whether we have bad eating habits, whether we deal in certain sexual practices, whether we think that, whatever the case may be, we all have an issue of taking ownership of ourselves as if it doesn't belong to another. But Jesus, Jesus loves us and God loves us to the point that he sent his son to take on a sinful body, to put himself in a body full of flesh, to be tempted as we are yet without sin. And this son lived perfectly lived righteously, continuously for a long time, for 33 years. I'm 28 and I just can't imagine just being around wicked people for 33 years and I'm God. Like that just sounds terrible. But for God to live righteously for 33 years and then choose to go on a cross, then choose for God to display his wrath on him. God, God for your impurity. God died for your lesbianism. God died for your pornography use. God died for your lying. God died for your bitterness. God died for your unrighteous anger. God died for your cynicism towards scripture. God died for your self-righteousness. God died for your lust. God died for it all. All of it. And the father judged the son as he is supposed to judge you. And that son went to the grave. I love Easter because we get to talk about the resurrection uh, more than we usually do. And we take communion with the cracker and stuff. Um, God, shout out to the churches that use real bread. Y'all are a stumbling block. I just want you to know that. (laughs) My church uses garlic bread. Why are you you making me like think about the bread more than the cross? I don't think that's wise. I'm off topic. Jesus went to the grave and any human being if he was just a prophet he would have stayed there he just would have been there he just would have been like buddha and confucius and all these other people but jesus as the old saints say got up and if you read the text in luke one thing i love it says that he got up and he folded his clothes god is a clean god come on somebody (laughs) the thing about that is the resurrection has been so helpful to me as a christian Because when I remember that that tomb is empty, then I recognize that there is no temptation that I cannot walk free from. When I recognize that Jesus defeated death, there is no way that I cannot look at sin and lust and pride and say, I ain't got nothing to do with you. Like it's possible because that grave is empty. But not only that, when he rose, he had a promise for us. He said that he would send and help her. Did you know that you cannot live the Christian life successfully without God in you? That you need the Holy Spirit to fill you and empower you to do all that God has called you to do. It is when the Holy Spirit gets up in us that we are then able to be the people that God has called us to be where now we see our bodies as instruments of righteousness and not unrighteousness. Then we recognize that our bodies was made for the Lord and because of that we don't use our bodies for sexual immorality but we use it as praise and glory unto God. This Holy Spirit will carry us into eternity where we see him face to face. Where all the fighting and all the dying and all the taking of the flesh and all the praying and all the confession and all the repentance stops because then we're home so I just want you to be encouraged that God is able to keep his own that God is better than everything that you could ever imagine I don't want you to leave here thinking that the world is telling the truth about God Let God speak for himself. If he says that he is good, he is. If he says that he is wise, he is. Because we were made to know that God and that God wants to know us. Can we pray?
God, you're holy. There are angels in heaven now who are hiding their faces while around your throne. God, you see us. You see every part of us that doesn't want you. But you also see the parts of us that do. God, I pray that you would move. That those that don't know you, even at a Christian conference, that those that don't know you will have their eyes unveiled today that they would see themselves in light of scripture, that whatever blindfold the enemy has placed over their eyes that you will remove, that you would show them yourself and all of the glory that is to behold in your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for those that do know you, God, that they would keep fighting, that they would keep going. They have need of endurance, that they would not give up. I pray for those in schools and in universities and in places that are full of darkness, God. I pray that they would understand that blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but meditate on your word day and night, God. I pray that they would fight to see you right, that they would not give in to temptation, that they would not give in to the lies of the enemy, that they have to be worldly to be accepted. I pray that we would all fight to see you rightly. I pray for the leaders here that you would help them, that you would guide them, that you would empower them for the rest of our time. God, while we're here on earth, please make us people that love you. Please make us people that delight in you. Please illuminate your word in such a way that nothing can shake us from it. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.